Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm working on my locomotive this week. I'm going to be making the link blocks. These are the unsung heroes of Walshirt's valve gear. From the thumbnail, they look like pretty simple things, but there's actually a whole lot going on with these tiny little parts. So let's go. I'm going to get started on the expansion link assembly, which is a large curved slotted link that goes in this area, attaches to the motion bracket. And this assembly is really the brains of Walshirt's. If you watched my wall shirts video, then you know how this link works and how important it is. Now the first piece of this assembly to build are the link blocks. And these are little bronze blocks that ride up and down in that curved slot. And the trick with these is they can't just be pins because that would create a wear spot on one place on the slot and would also create some additional weirdness in the rotation of the components as they oscillate back and forth. So they really need to be square or square relative to the curve of the expansion link. And that is the key. These pieces are not squares. More on that in a second. But first, let's get into my bronze bin and see if I've got something that will work. I've got lots of interesting options, but actually, conveniently, once again, the scraps left over from the making of the main bearings, I think, are going to be a really nice starting point. It's nice not to waste the material that was used for that setup. So I sliced a chunk of this off on the bandsaw. And I'm going to machine it top and bottom to get two parallel surfaces with an overall thickness the same as the final link blocks. Because these pieces are so small, I'm going to machine them together in one assembly in a setup that you'll see in a minute. I'll get that deburred and verify my dimensions. The overall thickness of this piece is fairly important, but not super critical. We can always do a little bit of sanding later if we need to. It just needs to run smoothly inside the expansion link assembly. And that is looking good. We're definitely close enough to proceed. Next up, I've created this madness on my rotary table. I've got a piece of thick aluminum bar for some measure of rigidity sticking out past the rotary table. Why on earth would I do this? Well, here is Kozo's drawing of the link blocks. Now, they might look at a glance as if they are little square pieces, but in fact, they are not. The left and right edges in this view are curved. It's a very, very subtle curve. In fact, the radius of this curve is 3.281 inches, which is the length of the radius arm in the valve gear. As this link block slides up and down in the expansion link, it needs to pivot around the combination lever attachment point of the radius arm such that changing the valve gear hookup does not change the valve travel distance that's imparted by the return crank. So these quote-unquote square blocks are riding in a curved slot in the expansion link with a radius of 3.281, but because these blocks are so small, that same radius has to be there because they're in a curved slot, but the radius is barely perceptible because of how small they are. Now, fun fact about that radius, 3.281, that is larger than the radius of my rotary table. And that's why I have this chunk of aluminum grafted onto the top of it. It's so that I can extend the reach of this and create the radius that I need for milling these blocks. Quick sidebar, one of the interesting things about Kozo's book is that he actually does not assume you have a rotary table. And yet, locomotive valve gear has a whole lot of stuff in it, like these link blocks that seemingly require one. So he has, for every similar part, some sort of contraption that you can build to get this done without a rotary table. In this case, he suggests this lever arm fixture that essentially acts as a manually operated rotary table. It's just a lever arm that lets you rotate the part. Now this would absolutely work, but let me just say, do not attempt this except on the very smallest of parts in the softest of materials. If you tried this on a heavy cut with a big piece of steel, that cutter would absolutely grab that lever out of your hand and whip it around and something terrible would happen. So uh, not necessarily recommended, but this process can be done without a rotary table if you need to. In fact, Kozo himself built this locomotive on a 3-in-1 combo machine, which if you've ever seen those, you can't really put a rotary table on one because the cross slide of the lathe is your milling table and it's just not big enough, nor does it have the right kind of T-slots on it. So having bolted this block of aluminum to my table, I'm now going to run the fly cutter over it to guarantee a flat reference surface to work with. This block of aluminum is unmachined on any side. I literally just drilled some holes in it and bolted it to the fixture plate but by machining it in situ, I guarantee a surface that is a valid reference. I just can't ever unbolt this piece now until the operation is done because the underside of this block is not machined, so it's not going to repeat in this position. 
This is the milling machine equivalent of turning a concentric diameter in your three-jaw chuck in the lathe. That diameter remains perfectly concentric until you take it out of that three-jaw. If you take it out and put it back in, you've lost that position that you had when it was machined. Amusingly, I did not actually have enough X travel on my table to get all the way across with the fly cutter. So I have translated down on Y a little bit to get more real estate surfaced, but I did have to leave a little bit of a hook on the right edge that I couldn't reach, but I'm sure that won't cause me any inconveniences later. Now I've got a pointer in the spindle and I'm getting some super glue on my workpiece and I'm going to super glue it eyeball center underneath the center of the spindle to make sure that I've got enough working area around both link blocks to be able to reach everything with the cutter. All these surfaces have been thoroughly degreased. They're spotlessly clean. I got super glue on there, spread it around real nice, and I clamped it down for a good couple of hours to make sure I've got enough strength to machine this. Those couple of hours gave me plenty of time to do some math. I went over to CAD and I modeled out this entire fixture assembly with the two link blocks in CAD to get all of the angles figured out for these cuts. The top and bottom cuts, which are the curved surfaces in this orientation, are easy because the center line of the part is that 3.281 radius, and then the top and bottom are simply that radius plus half the dimension of the part plus the radius of my end mill. Those side cuts, however, are tricky. They are radial cuts on the rotary table, and I had to calculate what those angles needed to be such that when I make a y-axis translation on the mill with the rotary table set at said angle, the edge of the cutter will sweep past the part and leave the correct surface on either side of each part. I also had to make sure I had enough room between the parts to get an end mill between them. I wanted the workpiece to be as small as possible so I don't have to mill a bunch of extra material, but I need to have room to get the end mill between them. I'm going to start by drilling and reaming the hole through the center of each link block. This is where it attaches to the radius arm. These are very easy to do because they're simply on the radius of the expansion length, that 3.281, and these are drilled and reamed to two millimeters. In CAD, I calculated that 10 degrees of arc at this radius was enough to give me space to get an end mill between the parts, so that's the distance between these holes. For the milling, I'll do the top and bottom arc cuts first because they're the easiest. As I said, it's just the radius of the center line of the parts, plus and minus the extent of the part, plus and minus the radius of the cutter. So this should be easy peasy. And oh my gosh, that is not going well at all. That cutter is stone cold dull. Well, that's certainly thrown a wrench into things because I calculated everything off the radius of that cutter. I dug through my bin and I found another cutter the same radius that I think might also be dull, but let's try it. And yeah, this is kind of dull, honestly. It's not cutting great, but it is cutting better than the other one did. It's pushing up a big burr and it's vibrating a lot, but it is also making chips, so it is cutting. But here's the thing about dull end mills. They make a lot of heat because they're rubbing as much as they're cutting, and they make a lot of vibration. Guess what are two things that superglue really hates? Yep, the superglue failed on that after two cuts. Regular viewers will know I'm a big fan of superglue fixturing for light duty machining. For small parts like this especially, it's fast, really easy to clean up afterwards, works really well on all sorts of materials. However, surface prep is really critical for it, and even with perfect prep, you are kind of close to the strength limit of superglue when doing machining operations. And in this case, that little bit of vibration introduced by the dull cutter was enough to murder that glue. Plan B then, first get a better cutter. Second, I'm gonna use an older school technique. Before super glue came along, model engineers used to do this a different way. I'm gonna start with a piece of brass that I'm gonna bolt down to my aluminum. You'll see why in a moment. I'm gonna go through both ends of that with a tap drill size, and then I'm gonna open up just the brass with a clearance drill size, and then I'm gonna tap threads into the aluminum so that I can bolt this brass plate down. The reason I need to bolt a brass plate onto the aluminum is that I'm going to be fixturing this piece with soft solder. Soft solder is the traditional quick and dirty fixturing method for very small parts in model engineering. People have been doing it that way since before you or I were born. However, of course, you can't solder to aluminum, so that's why the brass is necessary, and also why I had to lop the corner off of that brass, otherwise it wouldn't sit flat because of my uh, artisan fly cutting operation. Luckily, I still have plenty of that main bearing material left, so I cut another slice off of that, machined it to thickness once again, and once again, I'm centering it on the spindle. 
However, instead of gluing it down, I'm going to trace the outline of it with a scriber so that I know where to solder it into place. Here's my weapon of choice for this. It's regular old plumbing soft solder. Very basic stuff, not fancy silver solder, which would be much too strong of a joint for this. It's difficult to remove that afterwards. And I'm going to hammer it flat so that I can put it between the parts and it's not going to cause the parts to move or shift around or anything. I'll get some flux on there. Again, this is basic plumbing solder flux. It's an acid-based flux for this type of thing. And then I'll heat that up from below. This goes very quickly because unlike silver solder, this takes very little heat. Getting the parts vaguely warm is enough and you can see the solder is already melting. That was real time. It took seconds to melt that solder. And then once it's flowed nicely all around underneath the part, I'll put some pressure on that to make sure that it's sitting tight against my reference brass plate and just make sure that it doesn't float away or sit upwards on the surface tension of the solder while it cools down. That is looking really good. I think we are ready to try again. So I will bolt this plate down to my fixture plate. Once again, I've drilled and reamed the two center holes of the blocks as before. Luckily, all of the math is already done and the time spent making my aluminum extension was not wasted. So really, that little boo-boo with the super glue didn't cost me much time at all. Here I go again for the moment of truth, the actual milling cut, this time with a brand new, right out of the box, Niagara Cutter end mill. So guaranteed to be sharp enough to skin your enemies. That, my friends, is how an end mill should be cutting in bronze. That's what it's supposed to look like. No big mushroom burrs getting pushed up everywhere. Just nice, clean chips. This is going much better already. It's honestly kind of lucky the super glue failed as early as it did, because while it might have survived with a better cutter for these first few cuts, once I get towards the last couple of operations, these link blocks are going to be so small that there's going to be very little surface area left holding them to the fixture plate. So the glue probably would have failed later if it hadn't failed now. So in a sense, it actually saved me time. Sure, let's say that. I cut down until I could see that I was in the solder layer itself. There's a couple of thousands of solder between the bronze and the base plate. So once I know I'm through the bronze, then I mark my depth of cut there on the DRO and move down and do the same cut on the bottom at the other radius. One thing to watch with a radius this large is I need to feed the rotary table quite slowly because of course the rotation speed on the rotary table is my feed rate. And because of the large radius, there's quite an exaggerated surface speed at the cutter from a small amount of rotational speed in the center of the rotary table. These parts were really interesting to work on because, of course, the rotary coordinate space is your x-axis effectively. So all of your lateral motion is coming from the rotation reference on the parts. That definitely puts your brain into a different space. I made those two cuts according to the math and the DRO. But normally at this point, I would then measure the parts and see if I need to make another cut because the way I do things, I tend to cheat them a little bit on the large side just in case so that I can make another cut to hit the dimension. However, that requires measuring the part in situ to see if another cut is needed. However, in this case, I really had no good way of measuring this. There was no hope of getting a micrometer in there and a micrometer wouldn't measure correctly anyway because of the curve. The anvil of the micrometer is sitting on a concave surface on the bottom of the part. One way to get around this would be to put a small diameter gauge pin on the underside of the part so that it's contacting the surface on a tangent point, a single point, and then measure from the top curvature to the other side of the gauge pin and subtract the diameter of the gauge pin. That's valid, except that this part is so small and in such a cramped space, I'd never be able to get all of those metrology bits in there and hold everything square and take that measurement. It just would be physically impossible. About the best I could do was come in with the guessimeters, and as long as I hold the jaws of the caliper square to the part, it should be reasonably accurate. It's going to read a little bit on the large side because even the pointy ends of the jaws have a square cross section to them, so that cross section is sitting again on a concave surface, so it's going to read a little bit high. However, by the guessimeters, I'm 1,000th above the top of the size tolerance on this, so that puts me probably right at the high end of the tolerance, if not within it, on these parts. And worst case scenario, there may be a thousandth oversize. And that's okay, I can easily do a little bit of sanding on them later if needed, so I feel good about that. Now for the side cuts on these parts. These are what give them the pie shape. And these are done by rotating the rotary table to those angles that I calculated, remember, in the CAD drawing. 
and making my cuts forward and back on the Y axis. Because the rotary table is oriented with zero aligned with Y on the mill, if I rotate the table to the angle of the sides of the parts and then make translation passes on Y, I'm going to be creating that angle on the sides of the parts. So the rotary table is effectively shifting the rotational reference space of the hand wheels on the mill. The trick with these cuts though is that of course I don't have a DRO of any sort on my rotary table and I'm kind of spoiled by having a DRO. So there's two things that I have to manage here. One is the backlash in the rotary table. Now this vertex rotary table has very little backlash in it. In fact I can't even really detect any by hand but there's no such thing as zero backlash so there is some. Just to be safe every time I need to translate on angle for these cuts I'm translating all the way back to the left past what any reasonable backlash could possibly be and then coming back in from left to right. So I'm always traveling in the same direction for each translation. Forcing myself to do that just make sure that I don't accidentally change direction while I'm rotating and get into the backlash area. Because I've always had a DRO on my mill I've just kind of spoiled by that and I don't have that muscle memory for backlash compensation that an old school operator would have. The other catch here is that while I've calculated these angles precisely in CAD to one decimal place, CAD gives you decimal degrees, but rotary tables are not marked in decimal degrees. They are marked in degrees, minutes, and seconds. Now that conversion is easy enough to do. Half a degree is 30 minutes and so on. But in order to measure minutes and seconds accurately on a rotary table, not only do you have to be extremely meticulous with your backlash management, you also have to know how to read the vernier on your rotary table hand wheel. And not gonna lie, I'm a little rusty with that. I tend to make sure everything lands on even numbered degrees on my rotary table, so I don't have to worry about that. But I had to reacquaint myself with the vernier on that, and I think I did everything correctly. The good news is that dimension on these parts isn't actually critical. If they're a little bit too wide or too narrow on the, let's call it, lateral arc axis, that's just fine. It's really the dimension across the arcs between the inner and outer arcs that's critical. Those came out looking pretty good though, so let's liberate them now from their soft soldered fixture prison. That's a simple matter of warming them up once again at the hearth and plucking them off of there. Again, this takes very little heat because this is just soft solder and the parts are also now really, really tiny. The main challenge with soft solder fixturing, and the reason I don't do it more often, is because the cleanup is a big hassle. Unlike superglue where you just dunk it in acetone and it's like the superglue never existed, soft solder is challenging to completely clean up. So in this case I'm going to pluck all of the little pieces of detritus off of there, and then I'm going to use a trick that a patron showed me actually for cleaning up excess solder. You heat up the piece nice and warm, get that solder nice and molten, and then you wipe it down with a wet paper towel. You can actually wipe 99.9% .9 of the solder right off the surface by doing this. It does leave behind a one molecule thick layer of solder that you'll never get rid of. You can't just melt it off of there. It's held on by chemicals and surface tension and whatever science, but you can make it thin enough that it doesn't matter anymore. Then of course the link blocks have a layer of solder on the back of them that we don't want there. So that I removed with some very careful needle filing, trying to just remove the solder and not get into the bronze itself. And that seemed to go okay. Well there they are, there's the two parts. I'm quite happy with how they turned out. The centering of the hole on one of them is not great. I'm not sure where that error came from. If I had to guess, probably incorrect backlash management at some point on my rotary table, but as I said before, that dimension is actually not critical. As long as the distance between the inner and outer radius is correct, laterally there's plenty of extra movement in the mechanism, so that's not going to hurt anything. And the truth is we can massage the expansion slot a little bit to suit any error in these if we need to. But that is all the time I have this week. I was planning to do a little bit more work on the expansion link than this, but, you know, challenges arose and that's as far as I could get. I hope you enjoyed it anyway. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my patrons for making all this happen. And I'll see you next time.